Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming in and for the occasion. Is it on? Yep, thank you. First things first, if you could do me a favor and grab your version of this, which isn't being used as a camera necessarily, and please just turn it off uh, during the lecture. Thank you very much. It is indeed a great pleasure to welcome back to the A for the first time in, in several years, uh, Zaha Hadid, a frequent and longtime visitor of the school that she is an illustrious graduate of, um, here on the occasion coinciding with uh, a ceremony tomorrow at Buckingham Palace, Dame Zaha Hadid last June announced in the Queen's Birthday Honors for Services to Architecture, an incredibly uh, uh, meaningful uh, and in fact emotional moment I think for this school especially um, uh, at this stage of a remarkable career that really began in different ways in conversations upstairs in unit spaces and other parts of the AA. I think you all know Zaha already because of these kind of things. Uh, the magazine won't be speaking this evening. In fact, uh, it made me think that maybe for a person that doesn't need an introduction, most certainly the point to make is that this version of Zaha, which we all know well in the world at a time in which architects have become a kind of celebrity in ways that they most certainly haven't uh, at earlier stages, let's say, of modern life, um, is in fact a very real and meaningful dimension to what she does and what she believes in. I think uh, her project within architecture today has a self-awareness to that being a part of the lived experience of architecture today that is real and does matter and does have the capacity because of individuals like Zaha to shape the world we all live in through the impact of these kind of uh, uh, um, repetitions of the discussions and the conversations here in schools like this. The fact of the matter is, though, that this is hardly the person that's going to be speaking here tonight. You all know this. Um, uh, the services that she has been awarded uh, Dame Hadid in recognition of have to do with a project that really unfolds in a school like this 40 years ago that sees at its core a belief that architecture can be something more than what it's been to this point in the world. Uh, I was with a group of our recent graduates a week ago in India and at one moment during a dinner and there were about a dozen AA graduates sitting at a table, I looked over and they were all doing this to their iPhones. And I couldn't figure out it originally what they were, immediately what they were doing. What they were doing were flipping through portfolios of work and showing one another what they're doing. A generation that in, this, in that country right now is building a future which made me think of Zaha and her experience that evening because it's simply so different for your generation today than the world that she was a part of and grew up in in a city like London 40, 35 years ago here at this school. A time in which careers unfolded at a considerably slower pace and provided an opportunity for minds like Zaha's to form projects that then become the kind of careers we see here. I think the great challenge for students today is to imagine how that kind of experience unfolded with the kind of deliberate clarity and certainty that allowed years of deliberate investigation and discovery that prepared her, her collaborators, her office for a world that then eventually found it and is giving them the opportunities that she'll be showing tonight for the projects they're building. A very, very different situation in, in comparison to a generation today that seems to be getting offers to build buildings, build cities, and build countries the moment you step out of here. And I think one of the great challenges is how your generation can and will bring the kind of clarity and thinking that I would say Zaha's experience offers an incredible example of for all of us today. In the 15 to 20 years, she and collaborators had to prepare themselves for what that project is that she'll be showing you on the steps today. Um, it is almost exactly 30 years since a famous project of hers was prepared, a project called The Peak, which will be celebrating an anniversary, I think, in about a year's time, um, and which really signaled the arrival not just of a voice and a project, but really the unfolding of work that I think we'll see this evening is still alive and a part of a conversation, not just within her studio over at Bowling Green Lane, but in venues like this, and in fact, in conversation with clients, cities, other architects and designers around the world today. And for that, Zaha, thank you for coming in and sharing it with us tonight. And please thank, 
join me in thanking Zaha for coming in today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brett. Uh, maybe some of you don't know that uh, Brett also worked in my office 20 years ago. Uh, those were the years when we uh, slept in the office, all of us. Uh, myself, Brett, Patrick, Brian, they're all here, Satoshi. Um, we flopped around all day long from one table to the next to kind of catch some sleep. Uh, actually, Brett was the worst. Where is he? I would not. He's, he kind of punished himself uh, that year. Um, slept in a funny corner. Um, when, when Brett asked me a year ago to give, to give a talk here, I was a bit reluctant. Because the last time I was here, somebody fainted. And, and, but I had no idea who this person was. I only found out two days ago that he's been working in my office since that day of fainting. And, um, but he, I was not warned um, that I should be careful when I, well, you know, I'm, I used to hang out with all the kids. And now when I walk into one of the rooms in the office, they're all going to sort of semi-panic. Uh, stations or their mouth gets locked. Um, but, um, but we did something recently which was rather fun to do. And these are just some early images showing our really, uh, let's say, research in the last, this was done um, almost uh, 20 years ago, no, 25 years ago, <clears throat> both projects. There's a project for the Kafka Road, it's a kind of uh, the idea of fluidity in terms of the level of the city, which is the, uh, that, the pending re London in red. I've always wanted to do something in London, and um, I haven't. Uh, I mean, I've done the pool. Um, but that was a, a, somebody's phone is online. I don't know. Um, and this was a, a project for Cuthcara, which actually Brett worked on, not during the design period, uh, but maybe later when we wanted to deliver it. So that was in 86. Uh, this was done in 88. Uh, this, is, this is also next year, 80, uh, 2003 to 13, will be the year where 30 years from the peak, uh, 20 years since Vitra, 10 years since Cincinnati, um, 40 years since I came today. And um, it's been a very uh, interesting. Uh, uh, I must say, interesting career. I can't. I can't say it's always been fun, um, but um, well, people thought always oh, I'm having fun all the time. Uh, but uh, it's been at times quite difficult. But uh, I think the research has been and the work has been really very uh, exciting for us. Let me see where, where, this one. Yep. I'm not going to talk about the podium again, because I spent the last 20 years criticizing this one thing. Uh, here. It, ca it came first in mirrors and then it became black lacquered and then they stripped it of everything and it became austere in wood. It looks like a kind of a, some upside, upright coffin. Brett, please, you have all these people here. I'll do a competition. I mean, just to start off, just do a p place where, I mean, they get it wrong all the time, of course, this thing. Um, in China, it was oversprayed or almost fainted, uh, or too short. I couldn't stand on it. Anyway. Uh, these are some of kind of the, some of the early work of showing some of these kind of strategies, urban strategies about uh, some of these projects. Uh, there's a period I think which was for me very interesting between uh, '95 and maybe 2099, um, where every competition we, we did we lost. Uh, but there was still remain very exciting, well, till, till uh, Rome. Uh, the valleys, so this idea of the landscape, the valleys in the Quebec Library, the interior scape for the uh, a Royal Collection in Madrid, where it just kind of carved the idea of carving. Uh, the idea of the body, which is kind of uh, uh, layers of uh, different uh, kind of configurations over one side, so creating a series of voids. The idea of kind of a, a gradation of space from very small spaces to very large spaces 
and courthouses in the Islamic Museum in Qatar. Uh, and then this kind of really conflicting f uh, fields, which are in this case striated, which are which this diagram really appears uh, in other projects uh, over a period of time in Rome and later on now even in the facade for the, the Michigan uh, Art Museum. Uh, the Cologne competition, which was the first project we did, um, the landmass, so the idea that to re represent very large structures, uh, more like topography, uh, but in landmass, is with the, the idea how to develop a harbor development. Uh, all the landscape projects, um, you know, from uh, projects in Graz to uh, Wolfsburg to, uh, you know, some other installations where the idea of topography and landscape became a way, like a field where you, uh, and also with it, the total fluidity from the exterior to the interior, but the fluid space, and how we can achieve a complexity with many, many layers, so the idea of layering, uh, complexity, and fluidity all occurring all at the same, uh, at the same time. Uh, some shell structure early on for the Paul Library and the shells for the stations in, um, in Innsbruck and the uh, Salerno, which opens after 10 years um, in uh, Italy. To go to kind of these uh, conflicting fields or uh, which they kind of collide together or they move into the same, uh, into the same direction like in Rome. So the, uh, the Rome project comes out from this ideographic space where uh, the lines also guide you into a space, but create a special organization which differs from in a museum from the white uh, box, from the kind of the, the idea of the displaying art on a, in the kind of like a mo the, uh, museum or not, or uh, the white boxes, where these are, some of these drawings are the people who actually contribute to them on this room. They were done almost 30 years ago, like the, um, the field of the kind of the penthouse or the rooftops by Brian, who is here. The other master plans, um, uh, the flock of towers in Beijing, and the, the idea of the tower uh, engaging in the ground with a tail, so you have a, a kind of a, how you meet the tower meets the ground. Uh, Singapore master plan, or the idea of also topography and how it slides, making a, not a single building, but a series of buildings like a campus. Uh, there's a new space we've opened in Goswell Road uh, for our design gallery. And uh, more recently, these are some of the pieces which uh, were shown in Venice and this kind of an environment, let's say, when it opens and when it closes up, becomes more like a bed, a sofa, the shelves, which are like in calligraphy. Uh, going back to Kafka Road, which is a kind of modernist house, and the idea was create furniture, which is um, more uh, like uh, dividers in a room or objects in the landscape as opposed to uh, normal furniture. Of course, in those days, the graphic was very important, this idea of the kind of the shadow and the gradation, and, uh, and it, it, was, it was interesting that some of the current designers work in the office design pieces which are actually similar to these, uh, but with a slightly more fluid language. This was actually shown also at the AA in 88. I'll just go through these. These are more other environments which are a show in Philadelphia in two information. Our favorite person in the office, uh, Patrick Schumacher, who we could never find. Uh, actually, we were on a flight. Uh, you know, the, uh, the usual question in the office always, where is Patrick? And, uh, and uh, you know, everybody's looking for Patrick all day long. And we were in a, on a flight somewhere, uh, myself and an, one of my assistants and uh, Patrick, and we kept on losing Patrick. Uh, in the airport, you're going to say, where's Patrick? So at the end, the person who was helping us came and saying, where's Patrick? 
And so it was like, you know, it was like a kind of a, anyway, here's Patrick for you in case you don't know him. Uh, he's a very important figure in the office. Um, uh, not uh, necessarily the easiest person to deal with, but uh, has an incredible uh, asset to the office. Uh, but, he, but he is somebody who, I have to say, when I, I interviewed him, when I, he came to the office, I didn't want to interview him because I didn't like him. Uh, I had a immediate dislike for him. And uh, it was Michael Wolfson who hired him. And at the time, there were like, um, I kept on receiving these very weird portfolios from Germans. And, and they were weird. I mean, and they, I kept on getting every day another portfolio. And they all had the same address. And I thought, this is something very creepy. This is obviously one person. And anyway, I won't say it in public. One of them had his portfolio printed on his private parts. And it's the truth. And I thought, they, I don't want them in anywhere near me. So this guy comes into my door. And I, I thought it must be one of, the, one of them, one of the Germans. Anyway, Patrick then tolerated me. I kind of fired him every afternoon. And, um, but it was Michael and Simon who kind of cajoled him. And he stuck it out. And he's been a, a really, uh, I have to say, uh, maybe for me, building was sometimes uh, secondary. And I thought it was very important to build. Uh, but I, I enjoyed the drawings and so on. And um, I think when, at the time Patty joined the office, we got Vitra, and, um, and uh, that was a very important kind of contribution uh, to him. And, and uh, so that, that's part of the potato story. I mean, it's called Patrick. No, <laughs> it's important. But you, it's not my choice. You put your picture here, so I'm going <laughs> to... I'm a slave to Patrick. If any, nobody knows, you know, he sets the slides because now I'm paralyzed with a laptop. I don't know how to do this. Uh, you know, I used to enjoy going to a hotel room and doing my slides by myself. Uh, but now I have to rely on others, Patrick, of course. And, and he put his picture there. So what am I supposed to do? <laughs> and yeah, these are some of the other objects, uh, tables and so on. I don't know what the staircase is doing here, but here it comes. Anyway, so we decided, uh, this is another table. So the idea that actually through, through his furniture, one can also translate some of the ideas, which is like a kind of the idea of liquidity or liquid space, and how one can now, through certain kind of technologies, which are not necessarily very new, which is like a milling uh, plexi, the whole, the milling technology with the material, they make this thing like a kind of a, like a vortex. And it's uh, not necessarily always predicted, but it's, it's very interesting. The other piece, obviously, is a show in Madrid, which just closes today uh, at the Ivory Press uh, Gallery, uh, which was the idea to make a very large relief. Uh, there's a house in California, but the, it also becomes like a seat. And there's a detail on the leg of the uh, vortex the shop which sells nothing, uh, some jewelry, which of course would be the only office in the world would uh, spend two years designing a bracelet. So I calculated this bracelet, if I count the number of hours it takes to design a bracelet, I'd have to sell it for a million pounds. <laughs> you know, it's a very expensive bracelet. But you know, the kids are having fun. It's okay, it has to be perfect. Uh, so, you know, massaging it for five years would be okay. <laughs> anyway, this is kind of the chandelier as a ring. Anyway, so I, I have always had an obsession with hairdos. Everybody I meet, I say, hello, how are you? Do you want a haircut? And uh, obviously my other ambitions in life was to be a stylist, but didn't make it. I used to cut people's hair when I was a kid. Um, and all the parents complained to my parents. <laughs> but, but I thought I was really very good. <laughs> you know, I thought I had, the, I, had, I had the magic touch and I can carry on spotting every girl's hair. So I thought in the office we'll do a pop-up. 
So it goes back to the story of the poor guy who fainted here. Uh, I thought he has long hair. I'm not sure he's here today, but maybe not. Uh, so I asked Paolo, I said, where is Victor? And well, I did not know it was him who fainted. So I think he almost fainted again uh, because I wanted his hair cut. <laughs> anyway, we trimmed it. Anyway, this is a, my pop-up and I'm sure they will do it again. If there are any takers from the AA who wants to have their hair done, they can, I'm sure, apply to Melody and she'll accommodate. So this is a, the pop-up salon on the ground floor. Here's a kind of a space which uh, I thought it would be nice to kind of really lend to people. Uh, while the office manager and all the others are setting it up for us to work as a gallery, and to make products to sell, which will take some time. Uh, I can learn to people to have installations or one day events or whatever. And there's a hair salon. That's why everybody in the office, including myself now, has a streak of bright color. Um, friends of mine came and that's good. This is a, a, a model for another project I'll show later. And uh, we also did a, another pop-up last week for a young designer called uh, Thomas Tate. Uh, where they showed their clothes. And now we do the way of stuff. This is uh, a diagram of the, of the product we did for the um, Venice Biennale. So it is like a kind of a flower, but it's also to do an idea with kind of a shell or a vaulting made of uh, aluminium pieces which are bolted together, um, which is kind of uh, self uh, supporting, so you don't need any other structure uh, but the kind of the rivets and the bolts. And, and the idea is that you make many of them, they, they become bolts and they connect together, so they're a series of uh, flat columns. Similar to the ones we did for the serpentine, except this was had a had a substructure, and and the and the fabric which covers it, the one in Venice doesn't really require any other structure, but uh, the piece itself. And you can also walk in it. The machine which does the riveting and the cutting, and the bending and putting it together. Um, so one could kind of see a kind of a whole bunch of them. So it's interesting that through kind of certain uh, contemporary modern techniques, one can connect to some uh, maybe older pieces of uh, investigation like vaulting and columns. All the bolted rivets on the interior. And showing all the shell uh, pieces we've done, freeform shells of all the current projects, uh, like the pool roof, the aquatic center, the roof for the, uh, the whole form of uh, Baku, um, the Chanel Pavilion, the stations, and uh, there's a seven time. The stations in uh, Innsbruck, like these. Uh, these are the ones which are built in glass. Substructure is in concrete. Uh, interior structure is in, in steel, and and the cladding is all uh, pre kind of uh, uh, glass. So that's looking into space. The tour is the shell for the uh, Chanel Pavilion, which is a, the idea was that it can move from one place to the other. So the idea to kind of make a really a, a, using complex geometry to make something which could be repetitive or could be reinstalled and installed in different places. And it's a pity it never came to London. That went now it, in Paris, outside the Issy du Monde Arabe. All the research by the my Viennese students on shell structure. Uh, work by Club Felix Candela and uh, 
And I have to say, I was, I felt uh, Kisla uh, the, very much the other one out in the Venice Biennale. I want to go into it. This is also kind of many shells for another project we're doing in Algiers. So ribs riveting and shells, all the ribs on the interior. <coughs> this is another Patrick favorite. So to go back to Venice, showing what's on site on what has been completed uh, uh, this year. Uh, the pavilion for the, well, not the pavilion, but the kind of extension for the magazine of the Serpentine, um, made of tensile structure. Uh, this is uh, just uh, on the other side of the bridge. So the idea was to renovate the, uh, the magazine where they stored uh, ammunition and uh, to make it into a gallery space, to have an expansion for a social space uh, next to it. Uh, the columns, which are made of st in steel, <coughs> when they bring in light, these are and the and the and the fabric stretches between all these uh, vertical pieces, and you can bring in light in. And there is an outer skin, and there is an another inner skin. And there's inner skin. Uh, it bleaches with the light, so it's kind of light. Now it's it was when this photograph was taken, it was kind of sandy color but with the light it features and becomes white. This will be open sometime next year. Uh, Baku, uh, this is a building which basically is three uh, projects uh, done by Safet and us to, of course, uh, I have lots of AA students from the URL uh, in the office. I know how many. I actually asked how many were there, were, 200 or 150 or something. Um, and, but uh, there are also other teams from other uh, schools. And um, anyway, this is uh, three buildings in one. So this is a, a really, I think, the ultimate landscape project in the sense it's completely seen as the, the the whole building kind of uh, uh, stretches into the landscape, but there are three buildings connected by a lobby. So the three buildings are a conference center, museum, and a library. So th these are the conference center going out into the, so even uh, it's all fiber concrete, fiber and concrete with very large kind of glass into the outside, but the intention was to kind of create three, three buildings they are connected in through the interior as the the cladding being put with all the tessellation of the uh, of the tiles uh, like a space frame structure false colors here i'm not going to discuss scratch on this. uh space frame but uh, all the tessellation is on fiber concrete and it was interesting, it was done, the, all the paneling was done in Sharjah and shipped to, uh, to Baku. Baku is in Azerbaijan. So this is kind of the way it goes all the way to the landscape. So the building and the landscape are completely merged together into one piece. The tall part is the library. So the terracing of the landscape, allowing some sort of interiors. I want, uh, this took a long time to decide on what color the tile is. I mean, 
the whole project was very easy to go to do, except for the tide. Uh, everybody in the office had to be questioned about which color, white, beige, or gray. Suffered to ask everybody. And he at least asked Patrick twice a day. Those who were sitting next to them almost killed him. Uh, but it was not, that was not the end of the questionnaire. Then it was, where do you draw the line between the different material of the, the horizontal and the vertical, where you can't see it, but it's not the same material? So this is kind of those interviews on the structure, the lobby area. The Ramush takes you to the museum. So there are all the all these spaces converge uh, onto the single lobby. Uh, laminated uh, wood interior of the theater, as we see it on the outside with these kind of cuts. And then this idea of kind of really uh, rice fields or terracing. So we looked at the idea of terracing as a way of organizing space, but a much smaller, on a smaller scale, maybe on the level of the interior when we did the v &A, uh, museum extension uh, and, and other compositions where the idea of kind of terracing or topography. But on a larger, larger scale, we looked at how this idea of terracing can also create a very heavily layered and complex series of buildings which are uh, mostly commercial and how this kind of space between them, space of flying or moving, creates a different style. So to re really completely reconfigure uh, the urban plan of a particular block and how you, the, all the ideas which we've done before, that's carving, striation, layering, um, moving across from one to the other, and topography and landscape into one very large site uh, in Beijing. Um, I mean, they have authors of, the Chinese have very funny nicknames for it. Um, uh, I think, you know, well, I won't go into it either. Uh, but anyway, um, um, and it's very cu curious, it's in contrast to a very uh, kind of other kind of existing buildings uh, on the other side of the site. So, but that was, you know, this came after the event. What do we call it? You know, kind of galaxy. There's a project also was done, in, I was with day one myself uh, and a team of people, and then was transferred to China with Satoshi and Patrick, of course. Patrick is the kind of the angel who looks after everything. So these are, some of these buildings obviously connect above, uh, higher up on the top, some of them on one, one datum which connects all of them together. So the idea that uh, be, be below that datum you have mostly shopping or public uh, facilities and above is all offices. So there's one single plan which connects them all together but what it creates, it creates kind of these kind of crevices or valleys and the valleys become public spaces. So within the domain of a very kind of uh, corporate, let's say, world, uh, you create a kind of an urban domain, which is um, where people can, can use, not a, as a park, but more as a public, uh, public space. And within the interior of the, with the eggs or these buildings or the mountains, there's another interior space. So there is a, an atrium within the atrium. So there's an open M atrium and then an indoor indoor atrium. So this is before I think it was completed, um, where they can see some of the cushion on the street. 
and is obviously close by to a kind of existing courtyard housing, the Tong, which is these two worlds are very contrasted together. They don't kind of... And but it creates this kind of really interesting, I think, spatial experiences and complexities within the, the one single kind of uh, entity. And as you move from one to the other, you see a different world uh, next to you. This is when you are on the roof, looking down. The interior of the, uh, the, the, the inside of the kind of valley. So these are all public built, public domain, and, and with, I mean, in shopping, whatever. But you can enter, the public can enter within all half of the building. And this is, in a way, strategy for Soho China was going to create this space which could be uh, offices, living, shopping, wherever they are in the building. In this case, it's mostly offices and, uh, and shops and, you know, um, restaurants and so on. Uh, then I think it must be night of the opening uh, last week. So the idea that you know even office workers can can be immersed into a different kind of world, and through that you also you frame this different aspect of the city. It begins to kind of fill up. So it's kind of very different when it's, of course, empty and it's very full. This is the roof over the one of the atriums. So this is the space which is built on the, from the, that datum down. And these are the people who were there for when I gave a talk a week, two weeks ago. It was a talk with me and uh, uh, Shang Chun, who is the, one of the developers. The other building which opened this year is, um, well, a month ago, is, the, um, is in Montpellier. And this is uh, similar to a diagram we did for the Quebec Library in Montreal almost 10 years ago. Well, the idea that the, the library is a kind of a really made of these, uh, a tree of knowledge, and uh, that the that this reading rooms are more like uh, these um, uh, valleys where you, and the crevices between them, uh, the light between all the different valleys are the circulation towards the, the building. And so this idea of clustering, let's say, and, and these ad adjacencies of this and programs, this is, mo this is the program is, is a, uh, an archive, so it's a very heavy, a heavy building structurally. And there are three programs, the archive building, the library, and a, a kind of a, a sport facilities. Well, facility for support uh, administration for the region in uh, Montpellier. So the idea of kind of these heavy uh, clusters uh, are uh, clustering together, but it's it's very uh, you the, the way you read it is that the the rocks let's say are a program, the crevices in between the uh, the lines in between are mostly where the public can go. And also, there are the, there's a differentiation in language between the black, um, you know, louvers and the gold louvers. The gold louvers are, and the black louvers are mostly in public spaces, and the other ones are not. So you kind of have a kind of uh, a different reading, uh, as you see. So these are kind of very large, almost rock-like formations which cluster together uh, to form one single uh, entity, not like an for example, in Guangzhou, when there are two rocks uh, covering each other, but this is really they are just uh, clustered all together. So uh, all constant, these are all prefabricated concrete uh, pieces. Uh, 
uh, as you move into the interior. <coughs> you can go up to the kind of reading rooms, uh, theater, and so on. There is confluence of lines which uh, occur sometimes on the plan in Rome, they occur on the mullions uh, on these projects, so that you are, uh, you are constantly conscious of uh, that you are in the public domain and that you have access to the public in these spaces. And then they appear again in a, a new, more recent project which opens in two days' time in, in Michigan, which is a broad. Eli Broad uh, Museum, where the whole product is kind of made of uh, stainless steel uh, louvers to bring in line from all sides, and with a courtyard, and it's uh, at the edge of the campus. Uh, so uh, one side is the campus, the other side is kind of the rest of the city, and the idea that this kind of becomes a path for people who move between these two a domain is the campus domain and the domain of the city. It's a very simple diagram. Basically, it's a kind of a trapezoid where every room is trapezoidal, so every room has a special quality. Uh, and uh, some of them are very thin and very narrow. Some of them come much wider, where they kind of carve, which is which is the uh, kava, which is the uh, uh, courtyard, part of the entrance. There are two entrances on both sides. And this is a built uh, picture, so you can't, you know, there's not much difference. And because I think of the, uh, the luring and the trapezoidal quality, there's a kind of a double distortion. And you are standing outside it. <coughs> So that kind of diagram of the fields, which uh, kind of uh, intersect each other or crash against each other, appears in different ways uh, on a plan or a master plan, or in this case, on these movies. We don't have too many interior shots because it's, when they photograph it, it wasn't finished yet. On site, we have a this project in, uh, in Saudi Arabia called the Aramco. Uh, it's kind of um, a research center, a petrochemical research for a uh, facility. And the idea was that on one hand, it's a kind of a cluster which, which spreads out into the, uh, the, the landscape. Um, So these are kind of major studies of all the uh, elevations. So these are mostly kind of research facilities or rooms or classrooms and so on. The central area where you see this light gray structure are all in fabric. So it's a mixture of different material or it's fiber concrete and fabric to kind of allow for shading and uh, from the heat. And just kind of some construction photographs, uh, the prototype for the elevation. Mm -hmm. 
So you can define these spaces in the middle are mostly uh, the lightweight structure, and these are all the roofs for the uh, things. So there's a different kind of idea of landscape within the kind of uh, the desert scape. Uh, there is really kind of a product in Korea and Seoul, which was the, the park becoming uh, a building. There's no demarcation line between the park and the actual building. And the interesting, it's all covered, is clad in metal, uh, but the tessellation is changes according to the curvature of each segment. So, but it has a, it has a kind of an evenness. It's a design museum and also occupies a part where it becomes, uh, there's some kind of also artifacts. And the park goes all over it. Uh, some of the interiors. There's a project we did recently which uh, for the uh, National Museum in China. I'm not sure I'm supposed to show it, but since we didn't get it, I might as well do. Uh, and the idea was that to, to create a kind of a very large, this is 130,000 square meters, uh, to create a very large mass, but on the other hand, kind of create a scoop underneath, which is becomes a public space. And we had two kind of uh, almost two museums, one for contemporary art and one for Chinese art. Where am I supposed to put my finger? Thank you, Patches. <laughs> <laughs> Is that it? Yeah. <laughs> Go back one. We thought we'd paint the whole square red, but as a conclusion to the Chinese-ness, but it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't, they didn't buy the redness. I thought, you know, I've always liked red square, so I thought it'd, it'd be nice to do a building which is floating in some sort of red tile, but anyway. <coughs> I'll just go through this very quickly. It's kind of a catalog of all the, not all, some of the theaters we're working on uh, all over the place. The infamous Cardiff. All the lobbies, the idea of the public space, how the every each of these buildings kind of really swallowed or sucked in the public domain and the, the interior space. And the intention of this kind of fluid space which connects from the outside, the exterior to the interior, and how they become like and the above there's the Guggenheim and and how the Bellu is uh, the you know, elastica as in Miami, how this speck of elastication or flying connects different parts of the buildings or different parts of the street, all the interiors of all the different theaters. You know, a repertoire of many theater projects, Guangzhou Opera House. Rabat or Chengdu, Changsha, this is all of China. Um, this is kind of, I, had, I have an unfortunate nickname for this project, but anyway. Um, this was the idea of kind of having a, a very large theater, which is made of four theaters, 
they come together like a flower, like a, a petals come together. So kind of really this idea of the organic morphology makes this mass much more, uh, m more kind of uh, works better. So there are two flowers, one which is the, uh, one is the, a theater with many theaters and one which is a museum. So, um, I couldn't make it there last week, but Patrick went to the uh, groundbreaking. The interiors of the, this museum where these petals come together. These are very recent projects for a resort in Hainan. In a master plan with uh, mostly shell-like rooms, a very long, kilometer-long hotel or apartments uh, with these kind of little shells scattered on the side, but it's like a grid. I mean, a great kind of meet with the contours, kind of create these small spaces. Mm -hmm. On the other edge is a kind of golf course. Ripple-like uh, effect for the balconies. Uh, tower studies. The different towers we've been looking at for the last maybe seven years. One of them completed the Marseille one. These are different ones in different parts of the world, like KL. Or this is a master plan for a series of towers in, uh, in Beijing. And also the idea of the kind of the central void, uh, exoskeleton, all the structure on the exterior to free the interiors. The space in, in the side. There's a kind of a, a study for something in, also in China where there's a very large slab which has been hauled up. How to connect two towers together on the ground. We've always done these studies simultaneously of how to, the, what, what is the ground condition? And in this case, how do in these towers land on the ground, how they, they, can, they are connected? And there's a more recent competition we did for New York, near uh, one block or two blocks down from the Sigrun building. Also exoskeleton, exterior, scanner on the exterior, uh, with, with uh, keeping some of times the, the podium free and the idea to make these scoops to allow for uh, uh, like uh, winter gardens uh, on, the, on these scoops are <coughs> on a higher level, the voids. And then it becomes uh, extruded up as a continuous space, uh, continuous repetitive floors. So these kind of where you see these eyes are where the uh, these gardens are. Was was part of the uh, requirements to kind of to pub to kind of address the idea of the you know public space and garden. So you reverse the diagram. You don't make a building which is kind of very visible from the the top, but actually on the ground how you can uh, have the ground different than the rest of the block. This is one, two doors away from the Seagram building. These are the kind of spaces which are more public. Uh, 
uh, the central bank in Iraq on the Tigris with, the, with Lewis as a pre and uh, it's, it's like from one reading it could be like, a, like, a, like almost like a palm tree. And it comes on to a point. <clears throat> a very early painting, maybe also 20 years ago, for the stadium in Abu Dhabi. These are different stadiums we've worked on, uh, including the aquatic center in London, a series of aquatic pools for Qatar, like a kind of a field of uh, liquid, exoskeleton for the project in Tokyo, I'm showing only the last, I'm not saying where it is, but I'm just showing it. So, an airport somewhere. The idea of the petals of the flowers becoming uh, these spaces for the, uh, and the lowering. So, it kind of brings in light throughout the whole building. Uh, it's also separated, it's, it's also layered, so you have one, two layers of uh, operation, not only one single layer. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Zaha. Questions? <coughs> no. Yeah. Manic, you can, can Has you there always been a um, biological organic sensibility in your work or is it that's something that arose at a certain point further? Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> Has there always been an, a biological or organic sensibility within no. your work? No. It's more recent. More recent, so more perhaps recent. at what point? It's in 20 years, I say. For me, 20 years is more recent. <laughs> what perhaps brought about this? Development. Well, I think it started off as a more fragmentary, and uh, and I think that if, if I look at the plans of the peak, which was done 30 years ago, there was moments when it, they became much more fluid, and uh, I think when we became interested in the topography and landscape, that led to fluidity because uh, of the interest in having no kind of demarcating lines between uh, the exterior world and the interior world, so I think it led to that, and I think landmass, because we wanted to, uh, let's say, it was a solution to of, of really criticizing the, what I call the generic project, which was about a podium and a slab or a podium and a tower. And we, by getting rid of the podium, the idea of seamlessness, seamless connection between the ground uh, and, and the building began to emerge. And that's how, why it happened. Hello, Zaha. 
First of all, I really want to thank you and maybe Destiny that I met you personally in my life and um, for me to ask you this question personally. Um, I'm coming from Russia and maybe that's why this question and your answer is important for me. Um, I know that in your student years he was very inspired by avant Russian avant-gardist and suprematism. Um, do you think after so many years, um, do you think that in today's project, you can still find the starting point from there. Yeah, I mean, I think with that, with that, and that interest, would not have, maybe the work would not have developed because I was interested in abstraction and uh, reducing all the elements. And I think that was a very important, uh, that was a very important kind of inspiration. And also the, frag the idea of fragmentation, which was also, I mean, the whole idea of the kind of the cosmos and planetary things. Um, I think that uh, the way it, it, it was never, um, I mean, if you, re if you read about it and think about it, it, it becomes a bit too esoteric. But if you really look at uh, the idea of flotation and, and that led to research in, in, in structure, and therefore our work with the engineers and structure is very important, not because they want them to kind of make the building stand up, but to interpret how these things happen. And, Part of their preoccupation in the beginning was to do with lightness or flotation. So that was one. Uh, and I think abstraction. I think abstraction was a very opponent part of the research. You might, I mean, I, I am still very interested in that period because, uh, but I actually think at the time I thought the modernist project was not completed. And, but we have to do whatever we can to. But I think we went beyond that, uh, frankly. I think that. The research has been done in the last 30 years uh, by many people has gone beyond uh, the research of the modernists. And I think it makes it, I think that it makes it very exciting, but I think it makes the school very critical uh, because it's all, many of us started here. And, and I think that was, um, but I think the basis of where one has to acknowledge the base of that work. Zaha, I'm wondering, on, on that front, it's maybe shifting topics slightly from the, from the amazing catalog of buildings and projects that you're showing, but, you know, it's, it's remarkable that throughout your career you, you have been devoted and, in fact, deeply involved in not just academic life, but that the, the, there's a role of teaching within what you're calling research or investigation discovery. And I'm just wondering if you might want to comment on the way in which the teaching of studios throughout the years has either informed or opened up areas of work which either the studio, the, the Well, I always thought teaching right, uh, is very important. That's why it's, um, in a way, you know, I mean, it's a pity that um, I don't teach in London. I mean, it's not a hint um, that I should come and teach here. But, you know, I think it, it, no, I think it is, it, because I really do believe that there should be a connection between uh, ideas in terms of work and practice. And I think this is maybe one of the very few moments, I mean, maybe it happened 40 years ago, where actually practice is more exciting than, than school. I mean, almost. Because, I mean, I was studying here. Um, I mean, there was nothing happening anywhere. Um, you know, there was more thing happening in school than it was happening in the, you know, and, and, uh, and I used to always work a lot at this word practice. Um, but I think that these worlds should not be very, they should not be very different. Uh, and I've always believed in teaching only because um, people must understand, that, oh, you know, young people give you ideas. It's not the case. I think that, that I think uh, students should have a first-hand contact with those they, they, they read about and they, and that these ideas could be exchanged, you know, between these, because it should not be like, a, oh, there's a professor, they come and tell them what to do. Um, I think this kind of connection is a reciprocal connection between students, the student world, the educational world, and, and practice is very, very important. And I, I think it, it, it keeps one, it, it, it's very refreshing, uh, because um, even at the worst case scenario, there's always something discovered, you know? I mean, it's like any travel or trip. Even if you've gone to the same place many times, you always find, you always discover something new. And, and uh, you know, you have not done this before. And I think the same with, uh, with, with teaching. 
there's always something um, discovered through it, or uh, which I think is very valuable, or very interesting. And I think also you bring into it, you know, your own experience. Um, you know, I mean, I don't think everybody should reinvent the wheel with every single thing. I mean, I put a lot of pressure on myself and people in my office that we have to do new things all the time. But you know, also there's another thing which is important is that you have to build on your on your own repertoire. You have to perfect your repertoire and build it over without being repetitive. So each time you do it, you do it better. You know, maybe the you know, I mean, and it's okay to sometimes make mistakes. You can't do great things every time. Uh, and uh, you know, I think that's also a very important learning experience because otherwise, otherwise you don't know the, how to do the next thing better. So I think it is very valuable experience, yes. Zaha, um, looking at your recent work and hearing you talk about uh, all of these um, rep uh, developing ideas, I I'm struck by how the last 20 years is much more fluid and shell-like and involved with natural forms and land forms and so forth. So you're following a series of metaphors. And it struck me partly that um, there were also artists who were, have been involved in those. I'm thinking, especially with the picture of um, Patrick. In the background, it looked like almost Tony Craig. And I... <laughs> Uh, so th there are interesting affinities, aren't there, uh, course, which yeah. are happening in the art world, and I and I hadn't perceived them before. But, uh, Fontana, for instance, Luca Fontana, who was very much a '60s pleating artist, cutting these striated pleats, and so I, I saw in your work tonight these connections, which I hadn't thought of before, which is uh, a whole different set of uh, metaphors. And hearing you talk, you talk very metaphorically. At the very beginning, you, 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 you mentioned four or five uh, driving uh, ideas, which are somewhat formal. I mean, repeat, striations, fields, and so forth. So I see that uh, development and coherence. And <clears throat> the one thing that <coughs> I find a little bit disturbing is the lack of uh, fractals or scaling or uh, uh, creating a, a zoom in. Your projects are so large, on such a large scale, that the, uh, and like works of nature in a way, but they, unlike works of nature, they don't show that scaling so much. And it's partly a consequence, I think, of the speed and size and places you're building in, in Beijing, in the Middle East, and so forth. And I wonder if, in Baku, if you'll say something about the way that the speed and size uh, cuts you off from scaling fractals, going zooming in, let's say like Gothic mm. architecture does, you know, goes from the very big, as Mandelbrot said, to the very small. And your things, for instance, the Beijing shops and were at one scale. Do you, does, uh, do, do you think this is an idea that, I mean, you, you may talk about, but do you think it's... Uh, in your repertoire yet? Well, um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I think that um, I think it depends. I, I think there is a an issue with, with scaling on when you are doing uh, these very large projects. Um, but I think that you have they are different than those when you do a very small, uh, you know, differently detailed project. I think they need to be. I personally, they need to be like that uh, when they are very large. Um, so. Um, for example, the uh, not it's not the case with the um, with the Montpellier and bears like that. It's a bit very different um, because that definitely did not that has a lot of detail and also took a many many years. It wasn't it wasn't the time uh, issue, but I understand what you think about. But not in Baku either. I think maybe in China uh, the scale has, a, has an impact. What about the artists? The artists around you, like Craig, Victor, Fontana. Um, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I mean, I like the work. I'm. I'm not. I don't reference them. No. But I. I know about them. It's not very kind of. It came. I think maybe it comes from a. Uh, I mean, it comes from a different kind of source. Yeah, Fontana, but not. Not in the same way because these are. 
they're not necessarily, they are much more organized striations as opposed to kind of slashes. Um, that could also be interesting. There's a question here. Um, uh, this is a slightly odd question, possibly, but I um, visited your um, firehouse fire station at the Vitro Museum, and I thought it was absolutely brilliant. But um, my question is, I wonder if it, it would be relevant to ask, what, what would your studio or your work be like if you didn't have the computer? Because the earlier works it seems very almost crafty, as if you could have done the whole process by hand, and you, you see different elements coming together, and there's a, you, you can almost feel the, the hand in it. And I, I just wonder, I don't know if it's a relevant question, but I wonder what would your work be like, or where is your hand today, maybe? I don't know. Um, well, then nobody understands my drawings nowadays, so it's, uh, my hand is not there. Um, I mean, I actually think that that, in a way, changed a lot. Well, I think in your, one's early career, that hand is work. That was very important, uh, the, the um, relevance of the hand, and I, I actually believe in it. Uh, but um, I think that changed a lot with computing, and I still think there are people who can manipulate differently than than others. So something else was something was lost, uh, which is maybe to do with scale, and but on the other hand, something also was gained by trying to achieve these kind of complex uh, forms or complex spaces through computing. I I think that. Um, normative way of doing uh, drawing, which is like a plan and a simple section, would not, not to lead to this layer level of complexity. And I think, and also you can't, you can't see it all simultaneously. You can do, you can do some layers. You can't see it, uh, all the layers, all at the same time. So I think something maybe was lost, and, but I think something else was gained, which is, makes it possible to do all these uh, things. So I'll do here and then come back. Where was it? Where was it? No? All the way back. Yeah, thanks. <coughs> so, hi. Sorry. Um, uh, during, my f um, during a welcoming lecture um, of my first day at architecture school in Stockholm last year, uh, I was told uh, an anecdote of um, when you came to Stockholm to present your project, The Peak, back in the 80s. And um, as a comment, there was this Swedish professor who asked the question, what about the plumbing? Now, I was curious whether you remember your response to this question, and perhaps also if you could answer this question in relation to your recent projects. <laughs> Uh, in those days, I was asked a lot of uh, stupid questions. <laughs> uh, so I, you know, I'm, God knows what I told the guy at the time. Yeah. <laughs> so don't you think humor belongs in architecture then? Uh, doesn't belong? Don't, don't you think humor belongs in architecture then? I do, yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to survive, and I hadn't laughed in the last thirty <laughs> years. No, I mean, I think that um, I think that these kind of questions were really always uh, they were always kind of uh, first of all patronizing in the sense that they think that these things are kind of fantasies, uh, which could never. Uh, be uh, classified as a building because you cannot do a structure, you cannot do plumbing. Uh, there was a question always, where is a person? Uh, where is the tree? You know, and I think it was always, they could not, they, they were too abstract. And therefore there was no, and uh, there was always, you know, there was a lot of conversation about the edge, meaning uh, the detail. Uh, the edge of the building, how could you actually make um, these um, precise 
uh, edges as if it's not possible. And I think that, so I, that's why I have a resistance to, because plumbing, I mean, plumbing is not very difficult. <laughs> you know, but, I mean, structure is more complex. Uh, I mean, but even, I mean, I think now, I think the next uh, iteration, I would say, of any work would be about how one can resolve the issue of uh, the environment within the space, so uh, air conditioning, air cooling, um, you know, all that kind of ventilation and one can learn from other precedents. So I don't know where the plumbing comes into it, but uh, yeah, so I think it's, it's more to do with that, the idea that these are not uh, real things where it cannot, you cannot put a, you know, toilet in them or something like that. Thank you. I don't know. I'm, I haven't did ask that question. I don't know. He never asked me that question. <laughs> no, I think it's more like the you know Peter Cook and these guys yeah. uh, used to ask the question, uh, you know, about the plumbing and the edge, because, or where the door is, or you know, if the staircase works. And as you well know, Maggie, uh, you know, we we used to draw things which, without understanding, it was Elia who actually. Uh, in 10 minutes, explain to me how to do a staircase. I mean, I, you know, we didn't know how to make a staircase. Like it was like a nightmare making a staircase. And it was, you know, it was very important. It was very important that my, my final year of AA to discover that you can actually draw a plan, and from that you can, you can resolve all these issues, whether it's a, you know, and it's not because it has to be functional. I mean, you know, I can tell you stories about AA students where they had a kilometer long building, and they had no door in it. And I was like, well, where is the door? And they said, oh, it's the idea that counts. And I think, well, no, that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't work like that. Or, you know, or uh, I, had a, I should not say this story, but there was a student who, um, yeah. uh, who uh, was in my year. And, uh, and uh, he was, mm, wasn't really interested in architecture. And then he kind of, Finally, drew drew something, which was uh, anyway he he, he, went, he got a job, and he was <laughs> he was drawing this cavity wall, and it came and it was black. I mean, he 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 cut a section through the brick. <laughs> no, not not cross, cross section, a long section through a brick, and of course they fired him, and he thought that idea was what counts. I mean, this is kind of, because there were some teachers at the AA who always said to people, oh, don't worry about these things. It's the most important thing is the idea, you know. I mean, you know, I've, I've had students who, who, who worked in my office who came from a, this, you know, whole mapping planet, you know, where, you know, you map your movement or your pigeon or whatever. Uh, and, and, you know, and... They couldn't draw any, they couldn't make a model, they couldn't make a packaging. Uh, and, but I actually think sometimes skills, you know, helps you learn the next step because, uh, I mean, I suffered from not lack of skill, but, you know, we didn't know how to do anything when I first came to the A. Uh, and so we had to fight because the A was a more, at the time, I mean, it's not like that now. Where, you are a student and you have to find your way. Uh, you know, the idea that you have lots of people around or consultants and you have to find your way and find them uh, to show you what to do. And if you don't find them, you are lost. Uh, and that was that, uh, how it was when we were in school. Uh, and um, I mean, that's why I think at the time, the union system was very important and very good because we would go to other people's juries, and if we don't like a unit, we'll eventually uh, change it. And, um, but I think if there is a kind of a unison, you know, everybody is more or less the same, then there isn't variety, and you can't, I mean, shifting doesn't make any... So I think skill sometimes is good because it gives you the next... Uh, it gives you an edge on the next thing you do. There was a question right here. Hi, hello. Wait. Hello, Zaha. 
uh, we see you have lots of projects in China and uh, in terms of Galaxy Soho, uh, you see uh, there's a big contract contrast between the gigantic Galaxy Soho and the tiny Chinese people, normal residential house and uh, from your picture and uh, you know Chinese governmental officials and uh, businessmen who, has, ha, who have the power and money to change the city always like to build new things instead of protecting the old things. And uh, the price for establishing the new things is some kind of loose um, traditional culture. So I, I want to know what's your opinion on such loose when you design a new project and uh, what's your opinion on the relationship between architecture and uh, the surrounded environment. Thank you. What, what is loose? Loose um, traditional culture. Loss. Yeah, I think it, the Chinese are very preoccupied with this idea of lost uh, I think it's very, you know, very tricky. I, I think it's a very, very um, um, delicate um, balance between preservation, conservation, and newness. And um, but on the other hand, I mean, I think, I mean, in parts of China, I didn't, can't say I went everywhere now. I went to China for the first time 30 years ago when there was nothing happening. Uh, it was very beautiful, I mean, you know, but, um, but on the other hand, the standard of living was not very great. And so I think if I take a look about Beijing, um, I mean, there is a, an incredible amount of population. And you either, you, you either have to reconfigure the city and spread out everywhere, uh, or you have to kind of really make much more, uh, let's say, you have more density. And if you have more density, then you have to renew. Um, so I think that maybe eventually you know i think whatever they do now would become the new chinese thing you know i i i don't think that this question with history is i don't think it's really very necessarily very healthy you know unless i'm no, sorry charles um i mean i actually think that it depends on how they they kind of interpret it uh uh i i think that they maybe over commercialize it becomes a problem but the whole and they preserve all the courtyard housing. I think unless people live in them properly, I don't think they. I don't think they should just be there because of uh, some sort of a kind of a tourist attraction. I mean, if they can make them work as housing, uh, then I think it's it would be very nice. But if they are just there to be seen as kind of some sort of. Uh, lost past, and I don't think they should do that. One more question in the room. Hi, um, I'm from South Korea, and I'm one of the person who enjoyed Dongdaemun. Dongdaemun, that place is really famous for fashion town, and the place gonna be we have we're gonna have a your building for Dongdaemun culture complex and last July I visited that area and since the building built it and as I know the construction finished almost 90 percent so most of things are just fixed and then when I visit there I felt the their microclimate was changed and also because of its external material, it's, it's metal, and it reflects sunlight. And also there has some um, strong wind there. And because of that, we can't work without sunglasses. And <laughs> yeah, it's true. And yeah, so because of that, there's a, a microclimate was changed. So how do you uh, think about the changing the microclimate as building a new building. And also Korea is not suitable for growing gross, uh, grass. So, so even the place has a, a bit of green spaces by grass, but as I know, the place gonna be a change to artificial grass. So I want to know about that part. Can I see you, Patrick? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
please be my guest. <laughs> Well, I guess there is a kind of uh, criticism of our project in Korea, presuming there's a kind of... I think we're looking for an answer, not an interpretation. <laughs> well, He's translating. Change of microclimate. I'm not aware of that change of microclimate, so, so I can su only suspect that there's a slight exaggeration in your uh, question. I think I've been in the park areas, and I think it's uh, we have a series of sunken courtyards, and we have... Uh, overhangs and you can go down as well as the building comes over you. I think it's very rich spatial experience, a lot of different public spaces on different levels. Some of them, of course, if you grow, go up, they'll, they'll be more windswept if it is windy, but uh, other ones are more protected. I, I, I assure you, Patrick would be <laughs> think it's perfectly fine to have a <laughs> microclimate change there. Uh, perhaps. So, so I think uh, um, I, I feel <clears throat> Sort of sense of uh, exaggeration in your in your question. Uh, when I, I was there before the building was there, and and uh, there was a kind of derelict or unused stadium, um, and and so so I don't know. I mean, um, I'm convinced convinced, but it's obviously yet to be experienced that there's an improvement to the situation and a very interesting, rich uh, series of exterior spaces leading to interesting interior spaces, libraries, museums, etc. So, so uh, the kind of changing of microclimates, I'm not sure if that is the kind of kiss of death for our project. <laughs> Thank, you, Thank you, Patrick. Just to say, this, this wasn't the reason we had two microphones at the lectern. It's been made, made good use of. Uh, everybody join me in thanking Zaha for the evening lecture. Zaha, thank you.